He is a preacher in the church. When he notices his partner is getting better results than him in his duty, he becomes jealous. To excel above his brother and earn respect, he toils in secret. When his dreams are dashed, he becomes negative. Through the revelation of God's words, he prays and reflects. What does he learn about himself? And how does he practice and enter in? Early in 2021, I was a preacher and partnered with Brother Matthew to oversee church work. I had just started in that duty. There was a lot I didn't understand, so I often had questions for him. Mm. At the time, Matthew would often tell me about the corrupt dispositions he displayed in his duty. Gradually, I came to look down on him. I thought I wasn't as corrupt as him. And it wasn't beneficial to be partnered with him. I thought I was better. I even thought, how did he become a preacher first? I used to be his leader. I should be the one telling him how to be a preacher, not the other way around. Everyone seemed to think more highly of him since he became a preacher first. I couldn't accept it because I thought I could do better. To excel above him, I would often compare our work to see who did better in our duty. For instance, when Matthew told me he didn't have enough time to keep up with all his church work, I'd be happy, knowing that I'd already finished all the work I was responsible for, and so leadership would think highly of me. To my surprise, Matthew did a great job on all the work he was assigned. One day, the leader assigned us to identify some people to be trained as watering workers. In two days, Matthew found three prospects. I panicked, thinking, I've got to get going. I need to at least match Matthew's numbers. Otherwise, he will be commended and earn more praise than me. So, in just three days, I found seven candidates. Not too bad. Yeah. I felt very satisfied with my performance. But when the leader asked me about the candidates' situations, he concluded that none of them were fit to be waterers. I hadn't learned about their situations when identifying candidates. But Matthew's candidates were all suitable. They had caliber, good humanity, and were willing to do that duty. That's great. Yes. Those past three days had been in vain. I felt so down. I also began to feel jealous of Matthew. Why did he always get such good results in his duty? And why didn't I? He would always enthusiastically share God's words in our gatherings and would check in and follow up on my duties. With him always around, I couldn't stand out. I was so fed up, I even began to despise him. Why did I have to fulfill my duty with him? I didn't want him to be so noticeable, and I wished he wouldn't get results in his work. You were vying for fame and jealous of him. If you're in that state, it's impossible to work harmoniously with others. Yes. So, did you become aware of your issue and rectify it? Yeah. I didn't. I kept vying for fame and reputation. I didn't change. At the time, I was supervising the work of a church leader, Sister Anais. She felt bad about not doing well, so my leader had me give her some support. When I contacted her, she told me that she had already sought out Matthew to fellowship and that Matthew had shared God's words and helped resolve her issue. This made me feel like I was useless. I was unhappy. Matthew had met with her and meddled in my work. It was my responsibility to supervise this leader's work. I didn't want people thinking I wasn't doing my job and resolving issues. This made me even angrier. I didn't want to partner with him. I wanted to work on my own. Then I could better get people to notice me. 
From that point on, I tried to avoid him. One time, Matthew asked me to review a problem we would discuss in a meeting later. He called and texted me frequently, but I ignored him. I didn't want to discuss it. When he asked me questions about work, I wouldn't respond quickly. When he asked me to fellowship in a gathering, I kept quiet and told him to fellowship. I thought, as long as you're here, the brothers and sisters won't notice me. So what's the point? During one gathering, Matthew asked me for my opinion after he'd finished fellowshipping. I thought he fellowshipped too much and said everything I had wanted to say. I was unhappy. So I said to him, You're fellowshipping with an arrogant disposition, and you didn't expose your own corrupt nature and just vaguely discuss things. You outlined it, but failed to discuss details. I knew what I'd said wasn't accurate. I had other motives. I wanted to lessen his enthusiasm so that he wouldn't speak as much in future gatherings. When he'd send me messages asking how I was doing or about other things, I wouldn't respond. I thought then that he'd know that I didn't want to partner with him. I even wanted him to stop sending me messages. I just wanted him to leave and give me room to shine. I also wanted to do my duty full-time like him. So whenever the others needed me, I would be the one that would be there for them. Then they'd think highly of me. I wanted to quit my worldly job and fully devote myself to my duty. But I still needed to work to make a living and support my family. I felt depressed that I couldn't devote myself full-time just like Matthew did. I even thought, if I don't serve as a preacher, I won't have to partner with Matthew. If I'm able to switch to a different duty, I could be distinguished. But when I actually considered it, I felt a bit guilty and didn't know what to do. I prayed to God asking Him to help me understand my state. I thought of God's words, Duties are from God. They're the commission He gives to man. How should man understand them? Since this is my duty and God's commission of me, it is my responsibility. I should be honor-bound to accept it. I can't decline or refuse it. I can't pick and choose. What falls to me is certainly what I ought to do. It's not that I'm unqualified to choose. I just shouldn't. This is the sense a created being should have. Amen. Amen. Through God's words, I realized that our duties are bestowed by God. I should hold to my duties and fulfill them. I shouldn't be choosy and evade responsibilities. I ought to have that sense. Mm. Because my desire to surpass Matthew hadn't been satisfied, I wanted to quit my duty. This was so hurtful to God. I didn't treat my duty as a responsibility, but rather as a way of gaining fame and distinguishing myself and a means of winning respect and admiration. I wanted to quit my job and go full-time, not in order to satisfy God, but rather to vie for status with my partner and surpass him. When I wasn't able to go full-time due to practical concerns, I wanted to switch to a different duty to get a chance to distinguish myself. Reality showed me that everything I did wasn't really to do my duty, but rather to use my duty as a way to vie for status. God detests that. That's right. Later on, I came across some of God's words. Almighty God says, Cruel mankind, the connivance and intrigue, the snatching and grabbing one from another, the scramble for fame and fortune, the mutual slaughter. When will it ever end? Despite the hundreds of thousands of words God has spoken, 
no one has come to their senses. People act for the sake of their families, sons and daughters, for their careers, future prospects, position, vainglory, and money, for the sake of food, clothing, and the flesh. But is there anyone whose actions are truly for the sake of God? Even among those who act for the sake of God, there are but few who know God. How many people do not act out of their own interests? How many do not oppress or ostracize others in order to protect their own position? And so, God has been forcibly sentenced to death innumerable times, and countless barbaric judges have condemned God and once more nailed Him to the cross. How many can be called righteous because they truly act for the sake of God? There are some who are always afraid that others are better than they and higher than they, that others will be esteemed while they are neglected. This leads them to attack and exclude others. Is this not a case of being jealous of people more capable than themselves? Is such behavior not selfish and contemptible? What kind of disposition is this? It is malicious. Thinking only about one's own interests, satisfying only one's own desires, showing no consideration for others or the interests of God's house. People like this have a bad disposition and God has no love for them. If you are truly capable of being considerate of God's will, then you will be able to treat other people fairly. If you recommend a good person and let them undergo training and perform a duty, thereby adding a person of talent to God's house, will your work not then be easier to do? Will you not then have lived up to your loyalty in this duty? This is a good deed before God. It is the minimum of conscience and sense of which one who is a leader should be possessed. Amen. Amen. Through God's words, I came to understand my state. God says, Some people are always afraid that others will surpass, outdo them that others will be esteemed while they're neglected. This leads them to exclude others. Is this not being jealous of the talented? Is this not selfish and mean? What kind of disposition is this? It is malicious. These words were the truth, and they exposed my actual state clearly. Yes. When I saw that my partner got better results in his duty than me and was better at resolving the other's issues, I just felt like he was better than me, and I'd never distinguished myself with him there, so I envied and excluded him and didn't want to be his partner. I ignored his messages and didn't answer his calls. When he fellowshiped on his experiences, I didn't cooperate with him to maintain church life, instead trying to pick out his flaws. I even called him arrogant and attacked him, so that he'd be less enthusiastic and would stop distinguishing himself. I was so malicious. Each time I had to perform my duties with him, I'd feel so tormented. I always wanted to compete with him and was incapable of remaining calm. It was just like God has said, cruel mankind, the plots and schemes, vying for fame and gain, fighting the mutual slaughter, when will it end? Because my desire for status was never satisfied, I began to hate my partner. I only really wanted to get away from him so I could work on my own. I even thought about quitting my duty. 
I realized how malicious and inhumane I was. I was no different from wild beasts that hunt their prey, ready to contend and claw for my own interests. I only thought of myself, not the church's work. Even if the church's work was delayed, I wasn't worried or panicked. How selfish and vile I was. Yeah. If you're always vying for status and competing in your duties, you'll end up being detested by God. That's right. I also thought about why I couldn't just have a harmonious partnership with Matthew. I realized that in my faith I had set foot on a wrong path because of my satanic disposition. If I didn't seek the truth and resolve my corrupt disposition, I would lose the work of the Holy Spirit and descend into darkness. I prayed to God, asking that He help me resolve my corrupt disposition. Mm -hmm. Then I read in His words, What is the motto of Antichrists? No matter what group they are in. I must compete, compete, compete. I must compete to be the highest and the mightiest. This is the disposition of Antichrists. Everywhere they go, they compete and try to achieve their aims. They are the lackeys of Satan, and they disturb the work of the church. The disposition of Antichrists is like this. They begin by looking around the church to see who has believed in God for years and has capital, who has some gifts or special skills, who has been of great benefit to the brothers and sisters in their entry into life, who is very well regarded, who has seniority, who is very well spoken of among the brothers and sisters, who has more positive things than others. Those people are to be their competition. In sum, every time Antichrists are in a group, this is what they always do. They compete for status, compete for a good reputation, and for final say over things and decision-making power in the group, which, once they have gained it, makes them happy. That is how arrogant and rampant, odious and unreasonable the disposition of Antichrists is. They have neither conscience nor reason, nor even a shred of the truth. One can see in their actions and deeds that what they do has none of the reason of a normal person. And even if they hear the truth, they do not accept it. However right what you say is, it doesn't matter. The only thing they like to pursue is reputation and status, which they hold in reverence. So long as they can enjoy the benefits of status, they are contented. This, they believe, is the value of their existence. Regardless of what group they're in, they have to show the light and warmth they provide, their special talents, their uniqueness. And it is because they believe that they are special, that they naturally think that they are more important and should be treated better than other people that they should receive other people's admiration, that people should look up to them, worship them. They think all of this is due to them. Are such people not brazen and shameless? Is it not trouble to have such people present in the church? Amen. 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 Through God's words, I became aware of the severity of my actions. It turned out that in seeking fame and the admiration of others in my duty, I was displaying an antichrist disposition. Yes. yes. When I saw Matthew's fellowship was enlightening, he got results in his duty, and the others all praised him and went to him with questions. I envied him. In order to surpass him and gain status in others' hearts, I even thought about quitting my job to go full-time so I could be readily available the moment that anyone needed me to resolve their problems. That way, the others would think highly of me and wouldn't see my partner as being special. Each time I performed duties with Matthew, I felt like I was always living in his shadow, with no chance to distinguish myself. I didn't like how he won the admiration and praise of the brothers and sisters 
I even hoped that no one would respond to him when he sent messages in the group chat. Because of him, no one noticed me. Therefore, I spent all my time competing and battling with him, hoping to surpass him so the brothers and sisters would admire me. This was the kind of behavior I'd often display in my bid to win fame and status. Yes. When my ambition and desire wasn't satisfied time and again, I thought I had no chance of distinguishing myself and wanted to quit being a preacher, thinking I'd have a chance to stand out in a different duty. I realized that my obsession with fame and status was out of control. I was just like an antichrist in my love of fame and status. This desire was rooted deep within me. I realized that the path I was walking was extremely dangerous. Yes. God's disposition is unoffendable. He is righteous. If I didn't seek to make a change and only focused on status without a thought for the church's work, I would be rejected and cast out by God. I felt a deep disgust for my actions, and I wanted to change my ways. I prayed to God, asking that He help me break free from the constraints of my satanic disposition. Hmm. I read this in God's words. Regardless of what the direction or target of your pursuit is, if you don't reflect on the pursuit of status and prestige and find it difficult to put them aside, then they will affect your entry into life. As long as status and fame have a place in your heart, they will totally control and influence your direction in life as well as the goals you strive for. And it will be hard for you to enter the reality of the truth, much less achieve dispositional change. Whether you are able to gain God's approval, of course, goes without saying. What's more, if you are never able to put aside your pursuit of fame and status, this will affect your ability to adequately perform your duty, making it very hard for you to become an acceptable created being. Why do I say this? God hates nothing more than when people pursue status. Because it is a satanic disposition. It is a wrong path. It is born of the corruption of Satan. It is something condemned by God. And it is the very thing that God judges and cleanses. God most despises the pursuit of status, and yet you still mulishly compete for it. You unfailingly cherish and protect it, trying to take it for yourself. Is all of this not antagonistic to God? Status is not ordained for people by God. God provides people with the truth, the way, and the life, and ultimately makes them become an acceptable creature of God, a small and insignificant creature of God, not someone with status and prestige revered by thousands. So, no matter what angle it's viewed from, pursuing status is a dead end. No matter how reasonable your excuse for pursuing status is, this path is still the wrong one and is not praised by God. No matter how hard you try or how great the price you pay, if you desire status, God won't give it to you. If God doesn't give it to you, you'll fail to gain it. And if you keep fighting, there will only be one outcome. You will be exposed and cast out, which is a dead end. Amen. 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 Through God's words, I saw that my pursuit of status hampered my ability to do my duty. It kept me from being a qualified created being. Because I was always seeking status, always trying to surpass Matthew and gain everyone's praise, and always vying and competing, I became more and more malicious and lacking in normal humanity. I saw how seeking fame and status is not the right path and how it is a God-opposing road to ruin. Yes, that's so true. Given that I took myself to be a believer and a created being, I should focus on seeking the truth and stop struggling over something as useless as the pursuit of fame and status. 
Only then could I avoid doing evil. Hmm. Hmm. So I prayed to God. Dear God, I've recognized my satanic nature. Due to my obsession with reputation, I often feel jealous of Matthew and don't want to partner with him. Dear God, from now on, I'll repent and not seek fame and status. I'll only seek the truth and do my duty well. Please guide and help me, Almighty God. Hmm. Your fellowship has shown me that cherishing status to the point of sacrificing the church's interests is an antichrist disposition. You're liable to offend God when living like that. Yeah, that's a pretty serious consequence. Hmm. During my devotionals, I came upon this passage of God's words. What are your principles for conducting yourselves? Do so according to your station. Find the right station for you and do the duty you ought to. Only this is someone with sense. For example, there are some who excel in a profession and can grasp its principles. They should take on responsibility and do final checks. There are people who can provide ideas and insights, enabling everyone else to build on their ideas and perform their duty better. They should then provide ideas. If you can find the right station for you and work in harmony with your brothers and sisters, this is fulfilling your duty and conducting yourself according to your station. Amen. 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 God's words gave me a path of practice. I'm a regular person. I should be seeking to become a true created being, to stand in my place, work well with others, and do my duty to the best of my ability. Only this is the right path. Yes. I thought of how when God had Adam give names to the animals, he assented to Adam's names. He didn't reject Adam and come up with his own names to show how much greater he was, but accepted Adam's choices. This showed me that God's humbleness is truly lovable. Yes. God is the Lord of all creation. He is supreme, yet he humbly conceals himself. And as for me, I was just a created being, but I always wanted to show off and win respect. And even tried to suppress those who were effective in their duties for the sake of my status and fame. I was just too arrogant and irrational. I felt so regretful for what I had done. So I came before God to repent and prayed to Him, asking that He give me the bravery to expose myself in front of my partner. Thank Amen. God. Later on, I plucked up my courage and apologized to Matthew, exposing my antichrist disposition, which manifested in vying for status. After practicing in that way, I felt much more peaceful. Later on, Matthew found some of God's words that were relevant to my state, and they were really helpful for me. Thank, Thank God. God. I was just so grateful to God. I swore an oath to him that I would conduct myself as he asked. After that, I stopped ignoring my partner's messages and started updating him on the projects I was responsible for, allowing him to be kept up on my work and to assist me. We discussed our work and partnered in gatherings. We complimented each other and upheld the church's work as a team. Thank, Thank God. God.